Alaska, 90,000 square miles of wilderness. There's no better place to look for new creatures than Alaska. Here, hundreds claim to have seen a mysterious beast. He could have reached through that window and grabbed us and hurt us severely. And thousands more have seen mysterious objects in the sky. I was actually terrified. I started looking around, praying that somebody else was standing there. For the first time, strange encounters are analyzed by a top expert using cutting-edge lie detection science. There's a lot of elements that go into telling whether someone's actually lying or not. Are these accounts true? Do you believe in monsters and mysteries? My name is Thomas Fisher, and I've seen Sasquatch. I live in Ketchikan, Alaska, and I fish salmon for a living. I could actually paint my windows black and run on the radar. That's how well I know this country. From his boat, Thomas Fisher has a front row seat to the edge of wild Alaska. There's places here where man has never been. It's just immense. I don't know, I think there's probably lots of things out there in the brush we don't know about. Yakobi Cove, Southeast Alaska. Thomas Fisher anchors his boat. He is done for the day. I had a deckhand, his name was Oliver, a young guy, and we anchored up for the evening. On a beach close by, Alaska's most ferocious predator is hunting. And we were watching a big grizzly bear on the beach about 100 yards away. And the bear had been there for a long time, and he wasn't afraid of us or nothing. The grizzly is a monster. Thomas keeps a wary eye on the massive beast from the safety of the boat. The bear was huge. I saw him a couple of times before. I'd say the bear was at least 11 feet. Thomas watches the grizzly for over 10 minutes when all of a sudden, the bear's behavior changes. The bear freezes, seeming to sense danger. And then, one of the world's most feared predators does something rarely seen. Runs away, fast. Think something really scared this bear, you know, he, he, I mean, he was flat moving when he hit the brush. He didn't just amble off, he was just gone. Never seen a bear act like that before. What could make Alaska's alpha predator turn and run? Off on the left side, this black object came out, which I thought at first was a bear. But it wasn't. It was walking on two legs like a man. And like the grizzly, this predator is not afraid of Thomas. And it walked about 50 yards out and just stood there and looked at us for about 15 seconds. Thomas is now face to face with a creature he has never seen, despite his 45 years in Alaska. It wasn't a bear because a bear cannot walk or run standing up. I knew it wasn't a bear. He said it looked just like a man, only it had hair. There's a lot of difference between looking at a man and a bear. You know, and this thing had all the features of a man, only it was all hair. And it was huge. It was at least nine foot tall. The encounter is brief. It was a Bigfoot, just as plain as day. And he stood there probably 15 seconds. And then he ran about 100 yards into the timber. He did it so fast, it was just amazing. My deckhand looked at me and I looked at him and we said, what the heck did we just see? And we said, a Bigfoot. And Oliver, my deckhand, said, well, I'm not telling anybody. 
To this day, Fisher's deckhand will not speak about what he saw. But the old fisherman is very clear about the events of that evening. Definitely saw Sasquatch, and I'll stick by that till the day I die. And nobody will ever change my mind. Fisher's encounter takes place in the Alexander Archipelago. Off the coast of southeast Alaska, almost all of the 1,100 islands remain uninhabited, isolated from the mainland. And Thomas Fisher's Sasquatch sighting is just one of hundreds recorded across the region. I've spoken with well over 100 people in this part of southeast Alaska, alleged seeing a large man-like hair-covered creature. A faculty member of the University of Alaska, Dr. Robert Alley has been documenting and writing about eyewitness accounts of Sasquatch for over a decade. So what most people are describing is a very fleeting encounter with something that's very clearly not a bear. Today, he is traveling to Prince of Wales Island to evaluate physical evidence that the beast exists. I'm taking a hiking expedition up Kloak Mountain with Clinket elder Al Jackson. Al Jackson has lived on Prince of Wales Island his entire life. For as long as he can remember, there have been accounts of massive creatures living here. Friends of mine and, uh, told me when they were hunting, he was about 15 years old and he hunted with an elder. And the old man told him, if you're ever hunting up on Kowak Mountain, you have to watch out for those big black gorillas that live up there. He told them then that he said they marked their territories by driving these blown down trees into the ground, upside down. In a clearing, two cedars weighing nearly a thousand pounds stand inverted. Each cedar is driven seven to eight feet into the ground with roots facing skyward. The valley that we're looking at was logged in the early 90s. The trees were reported inverted back in the 1940s. Alley looks for evidence of heavy logging machinery. The 11-foot cedar has nothing other than very minimal marks on it. Even a grapple would have left some serious marks in order to place it in a completely vertical position. There's no evidence the trees are a hoax. The local legend is clear what they believe is responsible. Coming up. We couldn't shake this feeling of being watched. An island hunter believes he's being hunted. And a top lie detection expert determines whether Thomas Fisher is telling the truth. As you can see over here, a classic expression of disgust. I know what I saw, but nobody will ever change my mind. Alaska, the land of the great unknown. 90,000 square miles of desolate frontier. Over 500 known species of animals live here. And Thomas Fisher is convinced that a large unknown predator, fierce enough to scare a man-eating grizzly, is on the loose. The bear was huge. All of a sudden, something spooked him. Definitely saw Sasquatch. And I'll stick by that till the day I die. And nobody will ever change my mind. Fisher is one of hundreds of Alaskans who has reported an encounter with a Sasquatch. These people all generally have one thing in common. 
They spend a lot of time in the wilderness for a living. Woody Anderson is a native Alaskan. By tradition, he feeds his family by hunting and fishing. We've all been hunters all our lives. I started hunting when I was five years old. When he's not in the woods, Woody carves sacred masks for tribal ceremonies and for tourists. But only one thing puts the food on his family's table. I don't make a lot of money with my carving and stuff, so every day we eat salmon or deer meat. That's the food we, we feed our families with that. We end up spending a lot of time out in the wilderness. He hunts nearby Prince of Wales Island. A hundred thousand acres of dense rainforest. The island of Prince of Wales is important to me because I've been hunting there all my life with my family, so I know the country. I've been up to the mountaintops and down in the valleys. With the Alaska winter closing in, Woody takes his last hunting trip of the year to the island. I took my sister hunting over on Prince of Wales. We're over there for a week. It was raining and blowing one evening. We're gonna camp up on this mountain ridge. But the weather was just too nasty. We couldn't even get a fire going. So we drove down to uh, Eagle's Nest. It was already closed for the winter. There was no one there. We pulled into this campsite. We drove in by the bridge park there and tilted the seats back and tried to sleep the best we could. Woody settles for the night, but senses that something isn't right. We couldn't shake this feeling of being watched. The rain stops. Woody's sixth sense as a hunter is alert. Just really quiet, too quiet. No animal life, no bird activity. Woody can't believe what he's seeing. It grabbed me in the chest to fear. See something that big, that close, he was powerful. He was big shoulders on him. If he wanted to, I think he could have reached through that window and grabbed us and hurt us severely. But he didn't. It was one of those fight or flight kind of fear. You know, if you can get away, get away. If you can't, then you know you're gonna have to fight for your life. That's how bad it was. I sat up, I hollered, I screamed. The menacing beast disappears. An experienced hunter, Woody knows it's a Sasquatch. I'm out in the woods so much that I know what I saw, you know. It was mind changing, changed my life. There's something out there that I don't know what it is. It's not human, it's not an ape. While neither Woody or Thomas have produced physical evidence of their encounters, one expert is determined to find the truth. Maggie Pazian is a leading lie detection expert in micro-expression analysis. U.S. Homeland Security is one of her top clients. A hidden frown, a raised upper lip. While seemingly insignificant is the difference between someone lying and telling the truth. Micro expressions are expressions that we produce on the face that last less than half a second, sometimes as short as one twenty-fifth of a second. Most people don't see them because they're not looking for them. And just stood there and looked at us. There was no bear. There was a Bigfoot, just as plain as day. Every face conveys micro-expressions, which makes a lie difficult to hide. 
A lot of times we can subdue them, we can minimize them, but they still come through. Here is the first time where Thomas Fisher actually gives us a microexpression of the motion. As you can see over here, his whole face scrunches. Here, let me rewind it a little bit. Here you can see how he looks in his neutral element. And then we can see how around the nose bridge, all the skin is pulled up and we see wrinkles along the nose. The upper lip is raised and the classic expression of disgust. This indicates Thomas's disdain for people who do not believe his story. That's a very salient clue that, you know, he has real emotion about this story. Thomas Fisher believes that he saw Sasquatch. When I watch these interviews, I look for expressions produced by the subject that are contradictory to what they are saying. For Woody, the test of truth will be determining if he was afraid of his brush with Sasquatch, an emotion nearly impossible to fake. You see the eyebrows being raised, um, they're pulled together, there's tension in between the brow and uh, stretching of the lower lip, which is a classic sign of fear. These subjects saw something. They truly believe what they told us they experienced. Next, monster hunters chum for an Alaskan beast that rivals Loch Ness. It's putting a tug on it. Put the tug on it! And mysterious sightings in the northern skies. The radar advises they are picking up an air business. Primary park behind you. In trail. In trail, I think. Alaska is home to more than a million lakes. Lake Iliamna is its largest, and it's almost a thousand feet deep. Local residents believe a monster lurks beneath its surface. They see it from the water. We came up on it. I could see that it was bigger than the boat itself that we were in. They see it from the air. Just coming up on uh, Peter Bay, right where I saw the creature in the water here. Whatever it is, the unknown beast is massive. The lake is located at the north end of the Alaska Peninsula and is roughly the size of the state of Rhode Island. Across the lake, there have been dozens of reports of a monster. Witnesses describe a creature almost twice the size of a great white shark. Dull aluminum in color with rough bark-like scales. The creature swims with a side-to-side -side tail movement. Severed lines and torn nets indicate a powerful jaw and sharp teeth. What is lurking in the depths of Iliana? Could a natural explanation for the monster exist? Military contractor and science writer Matt Billy has been studying the lake for years. The only freshwater fish large enough to fit the reports from Mike Eliamna is the white sturgeon. It does live at these latitudes. It can attain the sizes that are being reported, but there's never been a sturgeon caught in Lake Eliamna, so we don't have a solution yet to our mystery. Despite the many creature sightings, no one has tried to catch the Eliamna monster in almost 50 years. Until now. Tinny Headland makes his living hunting the wilds of Lake Iliamna. I'm a registered guide, licensed to hunt all kinds of big game, moose, caribou, bear, sheep. I was 12 years old when I killed my first bear. Now Tinny is on a mission to catch an even bigger beast. I was raised on this lake. I've been hearing stories since I could, far back as I could remember. And there's something here, it's a given, I mean, but what, we don't know. Somebody's going to catch it, I want to be the one. Today, Tinney is teaming up with local guide John Beckler in an attempt to catch the lake monster. The first order of business, get the bait ready. 
Chumming is standard fare for attracting known monsters of the deep, like sharks. To be successful, the nastier the better. We got quite a bit of blood and juice. I don't think there's a place on this lake they haven't seen or something. Where we're going is, you know, a lot of sightings have been there. John has spent years on the water and believes that its depth may be the key. There's only been so much research done on the lake as far as depths go. Not every inch of it by any means has been looked at. I do believe in the Ily on the Lake monster. You know, monster is a funny term. Is it something prehistoric or something that's still, uh, you know, still a living species? Who knows? The Lake Iliamna region is completely isolated from the outside world. The largest boat available is a 26-foot, 400-horsepower Benz. While the boat is small, if they hook the big one, they plan to tow it back to shore without landing it. They're hoping to find a spot with a combination of water depth and a little protection from the wind and waves. I might go up here in this bay a little farther and see if uh, I can find a little deeper spot. At the edge of a large bay, they drop anchor and start chumming. Using large circle hooks, heavy Dacron line, a six-foot braided steel leader and halibut rods, the gear can handle an 800-pound beast. Anything larger is going to be a dicey proposition. But the two are game for it, and settle in to do what everyone who fishes does. Wait. John, I got something. After an hour in the water, something hits Tinny's line. It putting a tug on it. Putting a tug on it. Tinny fights the beast for several minutes and then John takes over. Ay, ay, ay. Something's moving. What we got? The pole is back in Tinny's hands as the beast heads for the stern. We're coming up with it, whatever it is. It's heading that way now. Dad, come, that thing's heavy. Yeah. And then as fast as it hits, it's gone. Hey, it got lighter. This thing, did it? You got I'm my... hooked into... Oh! And it got tangled up in our other line. We lost it then. That is the biggest thing I have ever had on a pole. Oh, my God. Oh, Man, that thing was heavy. That was heavy. I've it reeled was, up some 200-pound halibut yeah, before. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I just come from halibut fishing, and I never had anything that heavy. No. It was trying to take the rod away from me. The two work fast to get bait back in the water. Behind it too. But the skies are now darkening. It's getting, it's getting ugly. It's getting ugly. Can be ugly. We wanted to fish longer, you know, after we lost that fish. But the weather on the lake... It can get so bad that you can't travel in a boat the size we were in. And uh, it, it was coming. The lake is a man-eater. Tinny and John aren't taking any chances. On the average, probably two people a year die out on this water from, uh, you know, staying too late. And uh, boats capsizing. It's not a forgiven lake. You, you've got to respect it. It's, uh, it's a big water. Although this may be the one that got away, the two aren't giving up. We're saving up chum right as we speak to go back and do it again. Chum it up good and give it another try. Coming up, 
one of the most famous UFO encounters in the world. If the pilot said it was a UFO, who are we to say it's not? Alaska winters are long and harsh. Darkness dominates up to 20 hours a day. And each winter, hundreds of Alaskans report seeing UFOs in the sky above. In the U.S., Alaska is one of the UFO hotspots. Brent Mitchell is Alaska's top UFO detective, a full-time investigator. His clients include satellite manufacturer Bigelow Aerospace. For the first time, a major corporation is sponsoring UFO research throughout the United States. UFO sightings seem to occur in a very high percentage and in very large numbers compared to the rest of the United States. Brent lives outside of Fairbanks, where he catalogs hundreds of sightings every year. People who live here are instinctively looking at the stars because it's absolutely gorgeous. You have the aurora, you have meteor showers, so people are used to looking up. The most spectacular natural sight in the Alaska sky is the aurora borealis. The shimmering sheet occurs when hot ionized gases from space collide with Earth's magnetic field. Are the number of UFO sightings being driven skyward by nature's own alien lights? On occasion, the aurora sometimes brings out sighting reports from people who are not used to what they see. They try and interpret what they see in the aurora as something unearthly. Those are people who truly want to believe that they've seen something. But the most well-known close encounter involved a flight captain with 30 years experience interpreting the sky. One of the most famous UFO cases anywhere in the world took place in Alaska. It begins as a routine cargo flight on November 17, 1986. A Japanese plane loaded with wine leaves Paris on the long haul back to Tokyo. But over Alaska, JAL Flight 1628 becomes anything but routine. This is the first time they've ever had radar data for more than a few seconds on a UFO. John Callahan was the FAA division head in charge of evaluations and investigations at the time of the JAL flight. You have an airplane or a structure or a craft that's sitting outside that 747's window and it never entered my mind that it might really be a UFO until I saw the radar. Just after 6 p.m., Captain Kenju Terauchi and a crew of two enter Alaska airspace for the second leg of their journey, heading for Anchorage. At the helm, Captain Terauchi has nearly 30 years in the cockpit. At 6.19 p.m., the crew sees something on the radar. Unable to see another plane outside the window, they asked the control tower to identify it. Anchorage Center, Japan Air 1628. Do you have any traffic? Uh, 11 o'clock above? Japan 1628, heavy negative. Moments later, the crew sees a pair of lights on the horizon. Inside, uh, we have two traffic in front of us, about a mile ahead. Anchorage air traffic control still sees nothing. Over the next 30 minutes of that flight, a, a variety of incidents and things occurred that made this flight the mystery flight of, of UFOs. Coming up. Uh, we're not sure, but we have the traffic inside now. 
It's a huge ship out here. It's no longer an airplane. It's some kind of a huge thing out here that's four times as big as an aircraft carrier. November 1986, as JAL 1628 approaches Anchorage, the crew reports seeing strange lights. Over the next 40 minutes, one of the most famous UFO stories in the world unfolds over the skies of Alaska. The JAL transmission catches Anchorage air traffic control off guard. Sure, but we have the traffic inside now. And when the controller hears these words, it's like it's like death approaching him because it means that somehow he screwed up. He missed something. Something's wrong somewhere. Anchorage Air Traffic Control now asks Flight 1628 to maintain visual contact with the unknown craft. <laughs> We cannot identify the type, but we can see the uh, strobe lights. The color is white and yellow, I think. The captain is now seeing a massive, unidentified flying object. It's a huge ship out here. It's no longer an airplane. It's some kind of a huge thing out here that's four times as big as an aircraft carrier. Nineteen minutes after first encountering the unidentified craft, the crew nervously requests a new altitude and change to their flight plan. The goal, shake the unknown craft. Just uh, deviate uh, uh, from uh, some object, uh, uh, 240. Jupiter 1628, roger, fighting 240. Jupiter 1628, uh, heavy. Deviations approved as necessary. Air traffic control requests that the Japanese airliner make a full circle. Japan Air 1628 Heavy, uh, so I'm going to request you to make a right turn 360 degrees, 360 degree turn, and advise me what your traffic does then. Uchi believes the unidentified object has disappeared. But now military radar picks up something behind the Japanese airliner. 1628 heavy, military radar advises they are picking up intermittent primary target behind you. In trail, in trail, I think you. So you have radar confirmation of the object, you have professional aviators reporting the object, and military radar spotted them behind and to the left of JAL flight. Air traffic control requests another jet close by United Flight 69 to fly within sight of JAL and report any traffic. Uh, center from United uh, 69. The uh, Japan airliner is silhouetted against a uh, light sky. I don't see anybody around him at all. I can't see his sky but I sure don't see, uh, I'll see any other airplane. But United Flight 69 is too late. The craft has vanished. JAL 1628 continues on to its scheduled stop in Anchorage. Safe on the ground, Captain Terauchi's story makes it to the press. Within weeks, JAL is international news. 
This sighting was made by an airline pilot with 29 years of experience. The Federal Aviation Administration in this country began an investigation and it ended today. The FAA report concludes that the pilot story cannot be confirmed. They determine that the second radar image is actually an echo of the cargo plane. But former FAA department head John Callahan believes the official reports are wrong. Callahan's division investigated the radar and cockpit recording from the JAL flight. Well, a blind man could see that there was another aircraft or craft of some type there because it shows up on radar. It had to be some type of a craft. Callahan asserts the pilot's eyewitness account is independently confirmed by radar. Everybody had that target on the radar somewhere along the line. If the pilot said it was a UFO, who are we to say it's not? To this day, the flight captain maintains that he saw a UFO in the skies of Alaska. Coming up, a UFO encounter over Fairbanks. I looked up at it and I was just standing there and I was actually terrified. And a leading lie detection expert goes looking for the truth. The key elements in the face that we see are the eyes. In Alaska, the northern winter brings long, clear nights. Every year, Brent Mitchell investigates hundreds of winter UFO sightings. Those reports come from all different types of people. You have professional people, you have working people. The average person that reports it has seen something. When I first saw this UFO, I was like, this isn't man-made. This can't be possible. I saw a flash of light, and shortly after that, a large orb appeared. It was hovering approximately 800 feet in the air, and I could see it just as vividly as looking at a car across the street. It was bright white. It was silent. I thought to myself, oh my lord, <laughs> they really do exist. My name is William Smith, and i seen something I can't explain. I don't know what it was. One winter night, William Smith leaves work very late. It was 10 to 1, March 16, 2009. It's a day I'll never, ever forget. I got off work, it was almost 1 o'clock in the morning, and... I was pulling out onto the highway, and I seen this bright blue light coming from the left side. At first, I thought it was a truck, because everybody around has got big, bright blue lights on their truck. I thought, oh my god, I just pulled out in front of somebody. Then I realized that the light wasn't coming from the road, that it was coming from above me. And then I was really scared. The light was literally shining down through the windows and onto the road and pretty much everywhere. The UFO is now hovering over William. I got out of the car, I looked up at it, and I was just standing there. I was actually terrified. It started looking around, praying that somebody else was standing there. And I was all alone out there. It was like, oh my God, it looked like an eye. It had a white ring in the center of it with a blue circle in that. And it was probably 250 foot long, 125 foot wide. It was huge. There were no windows, no doors, and it was silent. And it was just floating along real slow. And then once it got past me, I jumped in the car and I started following it. It was exciting and terrifying all at the same time. I was keeping up with it, and it was starting to speed up, and it was going and going and going. I got up to about 90, and then it was just gone. It took off. 
I've never seen anything that fast in my life. It was, it was, went from there to gone, just like that. William comes home shaken by the UFO encounter. When I first got home, I was so excited. I couldn't, I could barely sit still. I did not sleep for 38 hours. Every time I'd lay down to try and go to sleep, I would close my eyes. That's all I would see was that thing flying along. That's all I could think about. I know I will never ever forget what I seen that night. I, I will never forget it. Top lie detection expert Maggie Pazian analyzes William Smith's UFO encounter. She's reading his face for micro expressions or tells. The question, is he telling the truth? We're looking for a combination of movements on the face that when they happen together, they relate to an emotion. If you look at this freezed frame of William Smith, the key elements in the face that we see are the eyes. The eyes are wide open. There's a lot of sclera visible, a lot of white visible above the iris. Um, the lower lids are, are, are pulled tight, um, which is another key element of fear. And then in the lower face, we see a stretch in the lower lip, which is very common in fear. He shows this over and over again. These are key moments in the interview where he's sensing this fear, and he's showing us that he's feeling fear. Pazian determines that his continued fear means that William is telling the truth. He really, truly believes that he saw a UFO. Incredible. There is not a doubt in my mind that William saw something, and that it was unidentifiable, and it profoundly impacted his life. As far as Alaska, sightings are so unique and so diverse. When people are looking up, they'll see things that you wouldn't necessarily see in other places. From its dark winters to its unknown wilderness, Alaska is home to many mysteries. There's places here where man has never been. It's just immense. There's something out there that I don't know what it is. It's not human. I know I will never ever forget what I see that night. I, I will never forget it. I think there's probably lots of things out there in the brush we don't know about. In Alaska, mysteries and legends have thrived for centuries and always will.